This morning we are starting a brand new series that I am so excited about. And I want to make a promise, which I don't make a lot of promises, because I was taught never make a promise that you can't keep, and you don't ever know that you can keep them. But I will promise this, that if you take notes and you study during this series, you will learn more in this book of Ephesians than you've probably learned in most of your Christian life. So I, I'm really, really excited about it, and I really believe that if you will uh, pay attention, study, show up every week, and really just let God speak to you, he will help you to understand who you are. Uh, the title of the series will be, Who Am I? That's what I'm titling this series, Who Am I? Because I believe that we live in a culture and in a time where people don't know who they are. People say, well, you know, I just, I just need to find myself. Well, well where are you? <laughs> You're right there. I need to find myself. I need to find out who I am. You know, people don't understand who they are. And I really believe that God wants us to know first who he is because you can't know yourself until you know God. A.W. Tozer said the greatest thought you ever have is what you think about God because what you think about God is a direct reflection of what you think about yourself. You can't know the creation without knowing the creator. So you have to know him first. So this whole series will be about our identity in him. And it's critical to understand our identity so that we can learn to live from him, through him, and through his grace. Several years ago, the Los Angeles Times reported of an elderly couple that were found dead in their apartment. They were both uh, found dead. And as they began to investigate, they did an autopsy, and they realized that they both had died from malnutrition. They starved to death. This elderly couple starved to death. But during the investigation, they found in the closet two brown paper bags, $20,000 a piece in each one. They had $40,000 at their resource, but they wouldn't use it. And they starved to death. A lady named Betty Green, for a long time, was called America's greatest miser. America's greatest miser. She died in 1916. That's a long time ago. But when she died in 1916, her value to state, $100 million. In 1916. You're talking about a lot, a lot of money. But she was known as America's greatest miser because she was so afraid to spend any of her money. She would eat cold oatmeal because she didn't want to spend the expense to heat up the oven. So it was easier to eat cold oatmeal. Her son one time got a leg infection. And she spent so much time looking for a free clinic that the infection spread through the leg and the leg had to be amputated, her own son, because she was looking for a free clinic and she didn't want to spend the money. She was incredibly wealthy, yet she lived like a pauper. She lived like somebody who didn't have anything. I believe the book of Ephesians is written to Christians who might be prone to treat their spiritual resources the same way that elderly couple and Hetty Green treated their financial resources. They had it, but they never used it. They never tapped into it. So many believers are in danger of suffering from spiritual malnutrition. Because they don't take advantage of the great storehouse of God's spiritual nutrition. God has given us so much. And there are so many resources at our disposal spiritually. So many. They're right there for us. My grandfather, Grady Lamar Collins, was born 1911. And he would tell me stories about his days during the Great Depression in the 1930s. I would ask him, what was it like, you know? His parents had to give him away. 
And so he had to live in a boy's home, an orphanage, basically. And, man, he learned to eat fast. If we sat down to dinner, he'd be the last one through the line and the first one done because he's afraid that somebody would take his food because he lived in a time that if there was a bigger boy on the block and you had not eaten your food, he was going to get it. And so he ate really fast. But he told me one time, he said, Scott, it was so bad that the banks would not give you your own money. They limited you in 1930 to 10% of your own income over a guaranteed or a limited time. They'd say, in this much time, you can only take out 10% from your savings. Why? Because the banks couldn't cover all the deposits. They were so low in funds. But God's not like that. God's not low in funds. There are no limitations to what he can do in your life. No restrictions. If we will trust in him, he can do anything and everything. No Christian should have any spiritual depravity. No spiritual deprivation. No spiritual undernourishment. He should never be impoverished. Every Christian should be healthy spiritually. And we're not. We live in a world where people are not healthy spiritually. And yet it's all right at our fingertips. The Word of God is life. It's health. It's everything that we need. No one who follows Christ should lack any immeasurable riches in the things of God. Because God gives us all the resources, and they are more than adequate to cover all of our needs, all of our past debts, all of our present liabilities, all of our future needs. He's got them all. They're all right there. In this book, the Apostle Paul speaks of, and he keeps using the phrase riches, right? So he uses it in chapter 1. He says, the riches of his, meaning God's, grace. Chapter 1, verse 7, he talks about the unfathomable rich. Unfathomable means you can't comprehend it. You can't even grasp it. The unfathomable riches of his glory and his grace. Chapter 3, verse 8, he says in chapter 3, verse 16, that it is the riches of his glory. So he talks about how rich we are in Christ. He uses that word riches over and over throughout the epistle. He uses the word grace 12 times. In this short book, he uses the word glory eight times, fullness or filled up or filled in him six times. And the key phrase to this whole book is in Christ Jesus. This whole book is about being in Christ Jesus. So he uses the phrase in Christ Jesus or in him 27 times in this little book because it's about our relationship to him. Because it's about what he can do because he is our source. Jesus is our source. He's our sphere. He's the guarantee of every spiritual blessing, of all of our spiritual riches, and those who are in him. I mean, if you're really in him, you have access to all that he is and has. Because it's an inheritance. Has anybody ever left you an inheritance? My dad passed away years ago, and you know what I got? Nothing. No inheritance. My father-in-law passed away. No inheritance. Well, maybe when his house sells. But look, you have no access to that, right? No access to stuff. But God has given you. More access than you can comprehend. More than you can imagine. But we don't walk in it. For some reason, I don't understand it. Like we have access to every spiritual blessing in the heavenly. That's what it says in verse 3 and verse 4. Chapter 1, verse 3 and 4. To every spiritual, every. But we walk around like, oh, man, life is so hard. Man, life stinks. Life, man, I just can't do it. I don't know what's going to happen. Blah, blah, blah. We whine and we cry and we complain and we worry and we live with fear. And we don't have to. We don't have to. 
So I want to start by laying the foundation and talking a little bit, and I want to educate you about the author of the book of Ephesians. Hopefully you already know who wrote the book, but you might not. Uh, some names in history we identify immediately. If I said Abraham Lincoln, George Washington, or the Apostle Paul, those are names that we identify immediately because they're important to us. But his name originally was not Paul. It was Saul. And they called him Saul of Tarsus. Saul was an anti-Christian, anti-Jesus. He hated believers. He was on the move to destroy these followers of Jesus. He was in the anti-Christian movement in Jerusalem. We see that Acts chapter 7, verse 58. The Bible says, Then they cast him out of the city and stoned him. This was the first martyr for the Christian faith. Do you know who it was? Everybody know who it was, right? Stephen. Stephen was the first Christian martyr that lost his life for his belief in Jesus. So they drug him out of the city on guess whose approval? Saul. Saul had papers. Saul had a job to do. And his job was to extinguish, to exterminate these Christians. So they drug him out of the city and stoned him. And the witnesses laid down their garments at the feet of a young man named Saul. He was from the tribe of Benjamin. Philippians chapter 3, you can see that in verse 5 as he shares his biography in that chapter, where he's from, what he's done. He was a Pharisee. He was a teacher of the law. He was a scribe. He was probably named after the first king of Israel, which was Saul. You can see that in 1 Samuel chapter 9. But unlike his predecessor, he was faithful. Saul of Tarsus was obedient and faithful to the law. He served God faithfully. He was a devout rabbi and a teacher of the law. He was a leader of this anti-Christian movement. He was serious about what he believed. But in the midst of his murderous activities of dragging Christians out and having them persecuted, he was arrested by Jesus. He was on the Damascus Road, and all of a sudden, he was blinded. He had to lose his sight in order to see. Do you get the irony in that? He had to lose his sight in order to see. Man, I would give up my eyes in a minute, in a minute, for the reality of who Christ is and what he's done for me, to see him for who he is. And Paul didn't have a choice. God got a hold of his life and changed him. Saul of Tarsus was a new man with a new name. God changed his name to Paul and called him to be the apostle to the Gentiles. He was a specific call, apostle. He was specifically called out by God. He wasn't a part of the original 12, but God had a distinct plan for him. Look at Acts chapter 9 with me, right here. Acts chapter 9, verse 15 and 16. But the Lord said to him, go, for he is a chosen, this is Paul, a chosen instrument of mine. How would you like to, for God to say that you are a chosen instrument of his? I mean, God said this of Paul, he is a chosen instrument of mine to carry my name before the Gentiles and kings and the children of Israel. And not only is he chosen to carry my name, but he is chosen to suffer. I don't think I'd like that part. Look at the rest of the verse. For I will show him how much he must suffer for the sake of my name. Hey, look, you are chosen too. We're going to see that in verses 3 through 6, that you were chosen before the foundation of the world. God chose you to proclaim his name. God chose you, just like he did Paul. You are a chosen instrument. 
And Paul was shown how much he must suffer. For us, we just get to suffer. At least God doesn't let us know what's coming. It just happens. But it's good for us. You see, the Bible says, Philippians 1.29, it has been granted unto you not only to believe on him, but also to suffer with him, right? Suffering is a blessing because it's shaping us and changing us and helping us to be more like Christ. And we should be suffering, not because we did something wrong. We should be suffering for his namesake. You say, well, how do you suffer for his namesake? Well, it's easy. Sometimes you have to make decisions. You have to give up relationships. You have to change your friendships. You have to do different things that might feel like suffering to you. But it's all for the name of Christ. Sometimes you might have to get up early or stay up all night long to suffer for him. To be on your knees for other believers that are suffering. You might have to give up sleep. You might have to give up food for him and his namesake. See, as believers, we should suffer for his name. And we should be willing to do that and rejoice in it because it's part of his plan. While Paul was ministering Antioch, the Holy Spirit called him to take the gospel to the Gentiles. You can see that in Acts chapter 13. It's in the foundation. Verses 1 through 3, the Holy Spirit led him. The book of Acts records his three missionary journeys, which you should know. Right? We should know his journeys, and they are all in the book of Acts. If you want to know his missionary journeys, you read the book of Acts. If you have problems understanding the book of Acts, get online. I preach through the book of Acts. You can go verse by verse through the book. He covered the Roman Empire in these three evangelistic journeys, and these are probably the greatest evangelistic endeavors in all of church history. Paul planted more churches and did more work for the kingdom of God than I think was, has ever been done. Next to Jesus, when I get to heaven, Paul's the first guy I want to talk to. I want to hook up with him. And how'd you do it? I mean, my life verse is grounded in something Paul said. Acts 20, 24 is my life verse. If you didn't know that, it's in the bulletin every week. It's there right by my name. Acts 20, 24 is my life verse. And the reason it's my life verse is because I want to be like Paul, who was like Jesus. I mean, ultimately, I want to be like Jesus. But Paul is a great, I mean, because he wasn't God and man. He was just a man. And he lived that life. Acts 20, 24 says, however, and this is Paul at the end of his life. However, I consider my life worth nothing to me, that I might complete the task of testifying to the gospel of God's grace. That's all that matters. And I want that to be all that matters to me. Testifying to the gospel of God's grace because it's all about his grace. Paul is the one who learned how to die daily. He's the one who wrote Galatians 2.20, I am crucified with Christ, yet not I, but I live by faith through the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. He's like, I'm alive, but I'm not. I'm walking by faith. He was that guy, and he did it. I mean, his whole life. Man, if you think about what Paul went through, you can read his resume in 2 Corinthians chapter 11. He was beaten three times with a cat of nine tails, where they lash you 39 times minus one, with nine balls at the end of this whip that have glass and metal and bone all glued in it so that when they whipped you with it, they would yank it and it would rip parts of your body out. Three times it was beat like that. He was stoned to death. It wasn't a rock concert. When they stoned you to death, they hit you in the face with stones and pounded your body until a pile of rocks killed you. And when he got up out of the rocks, you know what he did? He went right back into the same city and preached the gospel after they tried to kill him. I've never met anybody like Paul, but I want to be like Paul because I want to be like Jesus because Paul understood what it meant to live from his identity. He understood what it meant to follow Jesus, and he followed him wholeheartedly, man. He was beaten three times with rods. The Roman soldiers would use metal rods about four feet long, and they would just wham, wham, and they would well on your body. Uh, uh, and they'd hit you in the ribs and hit you in the back and just beat you. Five times his body was so broken up. 
You think you got back problems? Could you imagine what it was like for him getting up off the ground every day, every night, and pushing forward, and pushing forward for the kingdom of God, for his name's sake? We can't even get out of bed to read our Bibles. We can't even give up food to fast and pray. And this man, he was reluctant to ever give up. He was resilient. And he pushed and he pushed. And I admire that because I want to be that kind of guy. And I want you to be that kind of person that loves God and seeks him and desires him. About the year 52 A.D., 53 A.D., Paul ministered in Ephesus, but it was for a short while. So he's traveling through, and he stops there. You can see that in Acts chapter 18, verses 19 through 21. So he stops there in Ephesus, and he met, you know, ministers, and he goes through some persecution and some obstacles. Two years later, on the missionary journey, Paul stayed in Ephesus for at least two years while he evangelized and planted a church. He plants a church here. He's evangelizing, sharing the gospel, preaching everywhere. You can see that in Acts chapter 19, verses 1 through 20. You see him laying the foundation of this church. It was an area that was dedicated to the worship of the goddess Diana. It was a very hostile environment. If you want to see the description of his ministry and emphasis, read Acts chapter 20. You can see a description of his ministry right there in Acts chapter 20. If you want to understand the opposition that Paul faced, go back and read chapter 19, verses 21 through 41. So he plants this church, and about 10 years later, writes the letter of Ephesians from prison to the people in Ephesus. He is chained as a prisoner in Rome. And he wanted to share this, this truth, this knowledge, this understanding of who Jesus was and who we are and how we should live because of who he is. So he wrote this book to his, I mean, he's on death's door. He's been beat so many times. He's in prison waiting the execution of his life. But he's not worried about him. He's concerned about his brother's. He's concerned about the churches, so he writes to them. He says in Ephesians chapter 3, verse 1, For I, for this reason, I, Paul, look at that, a prisoner, not of Rome, of Christ Jesus. I'm a prisoner for Christ on your behalf, on behalf of the Gentiles. What does he mean by that? He says the same thing in chapter 4. I, therefore, a prisoner for the Lord. What does it mean to be a prisoner for the Lord? He's using the word doulos. It's the same word that James uses in chapter 1. James, a bondservant of the Lord Jesus Christ. It's the Greek word doulos. In Exodus 20, if a slave had served his master for seven years, at the end of the seven years, that slave was freed. Seven years goes by, the slave was freed. If the slave did not want to leave his master, he was allowed the opportunity to stay for the rest of his life and serve his master out of love for his master. So he would be taken to the city gates, and they would pierce his ear. And that would be a sign that he was a doulas, a bond servant, a servant who serves out of love, a slave to love. And they would serve their master for the rest of the days faithfully. Paul says, I'm a prisoner in Rome, but not because I've done anything wrong, not because I care. I'm a prisoner of Jesus because of who he is and what he's done for me. And I'm a prisoner for you. I'm here for you, and I'm here for the Lord. And he says in chapter 4 right here, and I want to challenge you. Look what he says. I, therefore, a prisoner for the Lord, urge you to walk in a manner worthy of the calling to which you have been called. So he's urging these new believers to live up to their calling. Listen to me. You have a calling. Every believer who has been saved by the blood of Jesus has been called by Jesus. And he has a purpose for you. And you need to live a life worthy of that calling. That means the way you live needs to measure up to the calling in which God has called you. 
And most of the time, our living is way down here because we're not even thinking about him. And yet he's called us to live up here. We need to get our focus on our calling and what he has done in us. And this book will, I believe, help us to really come to grips with that. While Paul was in prison in Rome, Onesimus, if you don't know who Onesimus was, he was a slave who had ran away from his master. Well, Onesimus actually meets Paul in Rome and gets converted there, gives his life to Jesus while he's in Rome. At the same time, Tychicus, who was a pastor at the church at what we call Colossians, was Colossae, he was one of the pastors there. He was also in Rome. So Paul, having both of these men in Rome with him while he's in prison, took advantage of this opportunity and wrote three letters. The epistle to the Ephesians, the epistle, epistle to the Colossians, and Philemon, which is a letter to Philemon. We say, who's Philemon? Well, Philemon was Onesimus' master, who was also a believer. So he gave Onesimus this letter to take to his master so he would welcome him back and treat him right. So Paul, being in prison, took advantage of his opportunity to still build up the body. He was never thinking about himself. It was always about others and his mission in life, what he was called to. So he sends these three letters out. So you got to realize, if this is 10 years later, the book of Ephesians is written in probably 62 A.D., right? 53 A.D., 52 A.D., he shows up in Ephesus. Ten years later, he writes this letter. The book was probably written, these letters, all three at the same time, probably about 62, 63 A.D. Paul was focused on building up the church. That was his life. That was his goal. He felt obligated to teach them the word of God and to help them to walk in faith. Everything that God does as far as establishing leadership is for your benefit. Look at this verse. We'll, we'll cover this when we get to it. But I just want to give you a glimpse, right? The Bible says he gave. Who's the he? It's not a trick question. God. Because only God can really give these things. God gave the apostles, the prophets, the evangelists, the shepherds, or some translations say pastors, same thing. All right, same thing. Elder, presbytus, and teachers. Two, here's the purpose. Equip the saints for the work of ministry, for building up the body of of Christ. All these positions have been given to the body of Christ for a purpose. Hear me. God calls pastors, he called the apostles, he calls teachers for one purpose, to equip the saints. My job is to equip you. Your job, your calling in life is to do ministry. See, in America, we've got it backwards. We want to hire people to do ministry for us. We want to go to check, write a check, and say, yeah, I've done my part. We think that's all we got to do is write a check. You know, as long as I'm, you know, supporting church. No, you should support the church. But you should also be a minister. Every believer, every Christ follower should be equipped to do the work of the ministry. You should be serving and praying and loving and giving and sharing. Because you are the ministry. You are the hands and the feet, the body of Christ. My job isn't to go out and do all the ministry, not to visit all the sick, not to pray for everybody. My job is to equip you to do the ministry. That's the goal of ministry. And every believer, we call it the priesthood of believers. Every believer is called to be a priest, standing between the lost and God. So the loss would come to the priest so they would connect them to God. Where you are the priesthood of God. You stand between the lost and God. And your job is to connect the lost world. You have a calling. And your calling has ministry written all over it. And if you're not doing ministry, you're not fulfilling your calling. You're not. 
A Christian that doesn't minister is an oxymoron or a moron. One or the other. Yeah, I said it. Because it's the truth. Either you are ministering to people, loving people, praying for people, giving your life away, or you're not. There is no in-between. You know, I'm kind of black and white. I, I try not to be, but I can't help it. It's the way God wired me. Let me blame him. <laughs> Look, you have a ministry and a calling on your life, and I don't want you to feel bad, but I want you to be involved in growing so that you can be equipped to do ministry. I want you to learn what God has called you because you're unique. Look, there's nobody in the world like you. Nobody. Nobody has your DNA. Nobody has your thumbprint. You're unique. Nobody has your past experiences. They might be similar, but they're not the same. Nobody grew up in your household with your parents just like you. God has shaped you uniquely for his glory and for his work. So I need to ask you, and you need to ask yourself, what kind of ministry am I doing? How am I involved in ministry? Who am I ministering to? You see, in our culture, we're so busy ministering to our wallet, to our bank account, to our retirement, and to our future that we forget while we're here. If you had a job, and this isn't in my notes, this isn't part of my message, but just think about this. Let's say you have a job and you're really intelligent. Let's pretend, all right? So you have a job and you're really intelligent. And your company wants to send you to Hawaii, right? So you're going to get sent to Hawaii to work for like three months. When you go there, you're there to, for what? To do a job. You're not going to build a house. You're not going to buy furniture. You're just there for a job. You know this is in your home. You know that one day you're going back home. You get the picture? We have a job. We need to be busy doing our job, but we're trying to build our, our home. This isn't our home. We're just passing through. This is our opportunity to do our job. We're on mission because we've been called ambassadors for Christ. That's what we are. God has called us to represent him before the whole world. Your only job is to represent the king of the universe. And he's provided every resource you need richly to do his work. To do everything for him. Isn't that awesome? That God calls us to this job of representing him to be true ambassadors in a foreign world. Because this isn't our home. And we're here to do his work. And so we need to be busy doing his work. Not doing what we want to do. And Paul got that. Paul truly understood that. That his job was to equip people to do ministry. My job is to equip you to do ministry. Your job is to do ministry. Your job is to give your life away. Not to build a future. Not to build a home. Because this isn't our home. I know you said that sounds weird, Scott. But it's the truth. You know, we get so wrapped up in this life. And I'm with you. I'm with you. I like my house. I like my stuff. But there's much more than stuff and money and time. We need to be doing ministry. One thing we need to be doing starts by praying. We need to be praying for the lost because we stand between us and them. God, save them. God, open their eyes. God, give them ears to hear. God, give me the words to share. Give me the opportunities to turn them to you so they don't spend all eternity separated from you in hell. We should be praying. And then we should be sharing the gospel, looking for opportunities. And then we should be serving, showing them how much God loves them, loving them. I mean, that's the whole difference is, right? We're supposed to be different. We've been called to be different. The greatest marker of a true Christian is our love. Because our love should be different than the world's love. But I don't see that in our culture anymore. I don't see that in the church anymore. And I'm hoping that we can get back to these fundamental truths in the scriptures. So let me take us to the verses we're going to look at today. The greeting, which is really called a salutation. It's the same thing. But it's a greeting to the Ephesians. Uh, we're only going to look at today the first two verses. Because I just want to lay the foundation. And I really want you to understand what this book is about. 
and, and how much we can learn. But you got to be here. You got to be present to learn. You got to study. You got to take notes. And I'm going to throw out a lot of verses. I'm going to give you a lot of history. I'm going to give you a lot of theology. We're going to deal with predestination, election, what it really means to understand that stuff in the next couple verses. And we're going to talk about God choosing you and what that means. And so I really hope that you will be here and that you will try to gain as much information so that you can apply it to your life because information without application is nothing but information with application leads to transformation and god wants to change us he wants us to be growing in our relationship to him so here's the the passage that we're going to look at ephesians 1 verses 1 and 2 he says paul an apostle of christ jesus he's an apostle of christ jesus by the will of god to the saints who are in emphasis and are faithful in Christ Jesus. Grace to you and peace from God our Father and Lord Jesus Christ. So Paul starts this letter with a, a traditional greeting. Paul, an apostle of Christ Jesus by the will of God. So Paul is writing from the authority of an apostle. So the first, you know, question is, well, what is, again, an apostle? It comes from the Greek word apostolos, all right? Apostolos, it's a Greek word that means sent ones. The apostles were designated. They were divinely chosen and sent. In the New Testament, the word is used as an official title for men only. Hear me. This is biblical. For men only. Men that God uniquely chose to be the foundation layers of the church. The receivers, the teachers, and the writers of his final revelation, the New Testament. When you drive by a church in Tampa and you see a sign, the Apostolic Church, don't go in there. Because there are no modern day apostles. There were four signature signs to be an apostle. One of the signs was you had to be with Jesus physically. I don't see Jesus walking around and hanging out at Starbucks. So there cannot be a real modern-day apostle, even though this new Reformation apostolic movement is going on over the world, and it's growing in number. People are buying the hypocrisy and the deception you got to be careful what you believe. If it's not in here, you should not believe it. We should only believe what God's Word says, not what people make up. So Paul is an apostle by the will of God. The apostles' duties were to preach the gospel. 1 Corinthians chapter 1, verse 7. They were to teach and pray. Acts chapter 6, verse 4. They were to build up other leaders in the church. Acts chapter 14, verse 23. And they were to write the word of God. Paul's credentials were not his academic training or his rabbinical leadership. Even though Paul was highly intelligent, and was trained under the top rabbi that ever came out of Israel. He served under Gamil, discipled by him, trained by him, who was the, the highest, and he got the greatest reputation of all the rabbis that ever came out of Israel. So he sat under him, learned from him, and he was zealous for what he believed until God showed him the truth. See, you can be zealous, but you can be zealous for the wrong things. I know people that are really zealous, that are charismatic or out there doctrinally, and they're really zealous about what they believe. But if it's not the truth, it's not the truth. The only way you get free is through the truth. The truth's what sets you free. Not what you've heard or what somebody said or what you believe, but it's what God believes. It's what God says. And that's why I'm, you know, always harping on interpreting Scripture in its context and understanding what God is really saying to the recipient, because it's critical to have good doctrine. 
it's critical so that you can truly interpret a passage. Because the better your interpretation, the greater your application will be, which produces true life change. Paul was not boasting or bragging about being an apostle. He said, I'm an apostle by the will of God, basically is what he's saying. I mean, I'm an apostle because it's God's will. I'm an apostle of Jesus Christ because it's the will of God. He didn't teach and write on his own authority, but it was by the dual yet totally unified authority of the Son of God, Jesus, and the Father, God. They were unified, and they called Paul as an apostle. In stating this truth, he was not boasting about his personal merit or who he was. He was not elevating himself above others. I hate it when people call themselves, how do they do that? Christ followers, right? And elevate themselves. Pastors with bodyguards, give me a break. Flying all over the world in their $10 million jets, give me a break. I am no better than you. Probably a lot worse. Nobody's better than anybody in the kingdom of God. The foot of the cross is level. Nobody should be elevated. Nobody. We're all the same. We all put our pants on one leg at a time. We're not better than each other. You should know that and stop judging. Don't judge. Paul was not putting himself above us. He remembered who he was. He was a blasphemer. He was violent persecutor of the church. He was unworthy and he was ignorant. He said of himself, and this is written for all eternity so everybody can read it. He said, I thank him who gave me strength, Christ Jesus our Lord, because he judged me faithful, appointing me to his service. Though formerly, I was a blasphemer persecutor, an insolent opponent. But I received mercy because I had acted ignorantly in unbelief and the grace of our Lord overflowed for me with the faith and love that are in Christ Jesus. Where did he get his faith and love? They came from Jesus. Look, you don't have faith or love unless Jesus gives it to you. You want more faith? You want more love? Talk to him. Cry out to him. People say, I'm just so weak in my faith. Hey, faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of God. Connect that to him and say, Lord, I want to grow in my faith. I want to be stronger. I don't want to doubt. I don't want to be worried. I'm tired of being stressed out. I need to grow in my faith. Help me, Jesus. He's the author of your faith. I mean, that, that's what it says in Hebrews. The author and perfecter of your faith, right? Hebrews chapter 12. That's what he is. The author and perfecter of your faith and of your love. You need more love. Go to him. He's the one with all the answers. Go to him. That's what Paul did. He gave me everything. I don't deserve anything. We are all unworthy. And that's why he said in verse 15, the saying is trustworthy and deserving of full acceptance that Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners of whom I am the worst, the chief, the foremost. Like every Christian, Paul understood that he was just a servant, a doulos, out of love. He knew that his apostleship was by divine enablement. He didn't deserve it, but God gave it to him. Look, when you look at somebody who's lost, and you say, God, you must have saved me because you need me, and you're messed up. God saved you because it's part of his plan. It's not because you are better than a lost person. Not at all. You're not smarter. Look, there are some highly intelligent people that are I mean, severe criminals. You guys remember Ted Bundy? Right, man, highly intelligent. Going to school to be a doctor. But he was a mass murderer. Look, God has a plan, and in that plan, he's at work. And your job is to trust him, to look to him, to lean on him, to really learn how to abide in him and say, God, I need your help. To understand that you don't need to worry about other people's sins. Stop judging people, putting people down, looking down at people. You're not better than anybody. The foot of the cross is level, and everything you have is a gift from God. Are you smart? I hope you think you are. If you're smart, it's because God gave you intelligence. 
If you're good at making money, it's because God gave you that ability. If you're good with your hands, who do you think gave you that? God did. God gives us everything. And he gives it to us, though, for his calling on our lives. So we have a job. We have a calling. So he equips us for the job so that we can do what we've been called to do. We're in a place, but it's not really our home. We're just here. So Paul says, I am an apostle by the will of God. It's God's will. You're saved by the will of God. Isn't that good news? If you're not saved right now, because it's not his time yet, and I hope one day it is your time, but we need to believe what the scriptures say. Next part of this verse, back to Ephesians 1, because I want to cover the whole thing. Paul, an apostle of Christ Jesus by the will of God. And then he says, to the saints who are in emphasis. Anybody here ever heard of St. Michael, St. Timothy, St. Matthew? Right? Where, where do we get those names from? Like St. Nicholas, right? We celebrate Christmas. We talk about St. Nicholas. We got all these saints. Aren't saints dead people? I mean, so why is he writing to dead people? Well, he's not. And it's critical for us to understand what the word means. No word in the New Testament has suffered more harm than the word saint. Even the dictionary defines a saint as a person officially recognized for holiness of life. See, the way it worked through the generations, if you study church history, because you got to ask, well, who makes that official recognition? Who decides who's the saint and who's not? Well, usually some religious group, and they have this process to saintize, to, to help somebody become a saint or not become a saint. Technically, it's known as canonization. So they would canonize certain saints and say, yeah, this person was a holy person. They lived a great life. After They would examine the life carefully, looking at their qualities, their character, their contact, and then get together and vote on, is this person qualified to be a saint? And they would saintize them. They would make them a saint for all centuries. And as interesting as that is, it is nowhere in the Scriptures. You do not find it authorized in the Bible. But yet for centuries we have made saints out of people when the truth is we are all saints if you're a christ follower but that's what i mean about believing the bible look hear me there is nowhere in the bible there's no such thing as a sinner's prayer nowhere but how many of you have heard of the sinner's prayer come on how many of you prayed the sinner's prayer right you bring people down, and you tell them, if you pray this prayer, you're going to go to heaven for all eternity. You'll be right with God, and you're going to go to heaven. You don't got to worry about it. Man, that's it. Man, you got your insurance. Go out and live however you want. You're going to heaven. There's no such thing in the Bible. It's called a sinner's prayer. Never. It's not in Scripture. But traditionally, they passed it down. They made it up. Like, oh, let's just bring people down to get more people saved. We'll talk to them about this prayer, and they can pray this prayer, and the special prayer will get you to heaven. But we need to look at the scriptures and be obedient to the word of God. You ever seen an altar call in the Bible? There's not. Trust me. There are no altar calls in the Bible. I mean, there's nothing wrong with getting together and praying. But they don't have to be every Sunday. Right? Churches do things by tradition because they've been passed down, but not because they're scriptural. If you guys want to do that, you'll have to get another pastor. Because I'm not doing that. I'm only going to do what's in the Word of God. I only want to live what's in the Bible. And yes, I still need help. I still need to learn. I still need to grow because I am far from all knowledgeable. I just keep asking Doug every time I have a problem. I got it. He's got it all figured out for me. So uh, it says to those who are saints, right? So let me just briefly talk about the word saint. Nine times in this little book, Paul uses the word saint. Ephesians 1.1, 1, 1, Ephesians 1.15, Ephesians 1.18, Ephesians 2.19, Ephesians 3.8, Ephesians 4.12, Ephesians 5.3, Ephesians 6.18. He uses this phrase, saint, nine times in this little tiny letter. He wants them to understand their identity. It's critical so that we live out of our identity. 
These saints are alive, even though at one time they were dead in their trespasses and sins, according to Ephesians chapter 2, right? Verses 1 and 2. Even though they were dead, now they've been made alive. They're alive physically and spiritually. They were alive physically before, but not spiritually. But now they're both alive physically and spiritually. There are lots of phrases in the Bible about followers, but this one's special. Some are called disciples, right? Disciples all through Jesus talked about being a disciple, being a follower, right? There's the way in Acts chapter 9, the followers of the way. There's different phrases for Christians, but saint is special because of where it comes from. The etymology of the word is the same word we get the word holy or sanctification from. It comes from the root word hagios, all right? That's the etymology of the word, and it means to be set apart, to be holy. So here's the awesome thing, is that when you are converted, when you are saved, when you put your trust in Jesus, the blood of Jesus, the righteousness of Christ, the holiness of God is imputed. It is imputed onto your life. You don't do anything. Jesus imputes his righteousness on you. That's what justification is. So you are justified by faith. Romans chapter 3, verses 20 through 24. Talk about being justified by faith. We have this imputed righteousness so that when God looks at you, he's not seeing you as a sinner from God's side. From God's side, you're not looked at as a sinner. That's why you're a saint who is faithful. See, that's why he, he says who is faith. You're faithful from God's perspective. Does that mean you're always faithful? No, but in God's eyes, you're, you're faithful because of what Jesus did for you. Because Jesus was faithful. Jesus was righteous. Jesus was holy. So from God's perspective, he sees you through Christ. But from this side, we need to be more faithful. We need to be more loving. We need to be more, be more obedient from this side. But you're a saint. You're in Christ. And that's why that phrase is, so because you're in Christ, first of all, nobody can take you out of him. You're never going to lose your salvation. Second, you got to understand that all your sins have been paid for. All of them, your past, your present. Right now, if you're in sin thinking, oh, we should shut up, I want to eat. That's, you know, that's sinful. But if you are thinking that right now, that's forgiven. It's all right. God washed it away. Isn't that awesome? And your present sins, when you judge people or talk bad to somebody or say something you shouldn't do or do something you should, it's been forgiven. And it's not a license to go do. You should want to serve him and love him because of who he is. Because we are in the world, but now we're alive. We're in the world, but we're not of the world. We were dead, but now we've been made alive, so we're in the world alive to be his witness. That's why Jesus prayed this prayer. Last verse that I'm going to look at, except for the memory verse I'm going to give you. Throughout the series, I'm going to give you a memory verse every week. And it would be really cool if we got to the end, I said, all right, let's go, or the beginning. So let's go through our memory verse. And everybody could quote it together because we need the Word of God. That would be so awesome. But anyway, uh, Jesus in John 17, you know what that is? Reference to that? It's called the High Priestly Prayer. All right, it's called the high priestly prayer because it's the last time that Jesus prayed on earth before he became the sacrifice. He was in the Garden of Gethsemane the day before he got crucified, and he's praying for who? For you, Israel. For you, Collins. For you, Jake. That's right, he's praying for you, Joe. He was praying for you, Tommy. That's right, he was praying for you, Sarah. He was praying for you, every one of us. He was praying for us in the garden before we were even here because he knew you'd be saved. It's all part of the plan. He knew you'd be here today. Look what the prayer says. I have given them your word, and the world has hated them because they are not of the world, just as I am not of the world. I do not ask that you take them out of the world, but that you keep them from the evil one. Why? Because he's attacking us. He doesn't want us to preach the gospel. He doesn't want us to love each other. He wants to divide churches. He wants to keep us from being the body of Christ. He wants to keep you from doing what God has called you to do. He wants to make you busy. 
If he can't make you bad, he wants to distract you and deceive you and sow doubt in your mind. So Jesus is praying for you to keep the evil one away from you. Think about that, how powerful that is. I'm not asking that you take them out of the world because we've got to be here to be a witness. But I'm asking that you keep them from the evil one. They are not of the world. Just as I am not. This is not your home. It's not. It's not my home. It's not your home. Stop living for here and now. Start living for them. The Father, the Son, the Holy Spirit. For the Godhead, for his purpose, for his goals in your life, for his desires. And not just yours. And I know it's hard. That's why I admire Paul so much. I admire him because I want to be like that. Man, he, in the flesh, laid down his life, took up his cross, died daily. I don't want to be that kind of guy. And I want you to be that kind of believer. I want us all, men and women alike, to love him the same way, to serve him and honor him. All right, last, let me finish up so you guys can eat. I know you're tired of hearing me. Grace to you and peace is how he ends it in the Lord Jesus Christ, right? That's that phrase at the end. That's a common greeting among Christians in the early church. That was the common way they greeted each other in the early church. But to greet a brother in that way was much more than just, hey, man, how you doing? How's it hanging? How's it going? It wasn't like just interested in your well-being. That's not the greeting. There is significance here, which is critical. It is an acknowledgement of the divine grace in which we stand. Grace and peace to you. It's his divine grace. It's all because of him. You didn't do anything. So this acknowledgement is like, yes, you are in his grace because of him. You are in his grace because of him. We are in his grace. We are standing in his grace. We stand in his grace, which has made us members together of the body of Christ. We are a part of God's divine family. No matter where you've lived or what your past is about or what your nationality is, we are all one. Man, isn't that awesome? Isn't that awesome? Grace and peace to you. And because we've experienced grace, we have peace with God, according to Romans 5.1. And then his peace fills our hearts it fills our hearts so that it overflows. That's the whole story of this greeting, peace and grace to you. You know, that's why Philippians 4, 7 says not to be anxious for anything. Why? Because the peace of God which transcends all understanding will guard your hearts and minds in Christ Jesus. We need to walk in that peace. Not live in worry, fear, anxiety, stress. Not needing some bottle, getting drunk or drinking, not doing drugs. We need Jesus' peace. That is eternal. We don't even need the relationship aspect. It's like we need all this stuff. We need Jesus. He'll take care of everything else. Will you pray with me? Lord, I pray this book transforms our lives or at least helps us, God, to become more like Jesus. Pray, God, that you would work in us and work through us and that you would open our eyes to truth, Father, truth that would be transformational. Thank you for your grace in which we stand, that has connected us all, Father, as a body in Christ. Thank you. I pray that you'd be glorified in this place, Father. Be glorified in our lives. In Jesus' name, amen.